Hello to everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Aldo Costa and uh, you are listening Beyond the Grid. Hi everyone and welcome to Beyond the Grid, presented by the new Bose noise cancelling headphone 700. My name's Tom Clarkson and my guest this week is a man whose name may not be immediately familiar to all of you, but I guarantee you he's got an interesting story to tell. Now, if I were to ask you who's won the most world titles in F1 history, you might immediately answer Michael Schumacher. Or if you were thinking outside the box a little bit, you might say Adrian Newey or Enzo Ferrari. Well, in fact, it's none of them. It's an unassuming Italian engineer who's been a key part of the sport's two biggest dynasties. I'm talking, of course, about Aldo Costa. Aldo has won 26 world championships across a career spent predominantly with Ferrari and Mercedes, although he learnt the ropes with Minardi back in the late 80s and early 90s. While at Ferrari, he worked very closely with Ross Braun and Rory Byrne, and it was the respect and friendship that developed between him and Braun that led to him switching to Mercedes at the start of this decade. And unsurprisingly, more champagne spraying has followed. Aldo recently left Mercedes to join Delara, where his job description is much wider than just F1, although he'll retain links with F1 through Delara's work with Haas. We thought it was the perfect moment to reflect on his 30-year F1 career, during which he's etched his name firmly into the history books. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Aldo, welcome to the show. It's lovely to have you on Beyond the Grid. Now, Thank you. You have an incredible record over the last 30 years in Formula One. By my calculations, including 2019, we're looking at 26 world titles, 199 race wins, which is more than Michael Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton <laughs> put together. I mean, yeah. it's an incredible record. When I say those stats to you, what does it make you feel? Yeah, it's... Uh, I Something for me still unbelievable. Every day is unbelievable. Yeah, my career was, uh, yeah, very, very long and, uh, I had really the, uh, opportunity and the pleasure, uh, to, um, to follow two big cycle of my life. The one cycle, winning cycle at Ferrari and, uh, and now the all winning cycle here at Mercedes, uh, um, working with, uh, a lot of talented people, talented engineer, team principal, drivers. So really, really an unbelievable experience. We'll come on to the sort of life at Mercedes and Ferrari, but just talking about you as an engineer, what is your greatest strength? It's difficult to judge yourself, of course. Um, let's say my three big cycle uh, Minardi, um, Ferrari, and then Mercedes, uh, I found myself uh, building, um, building a team of engineers, uh, a team of designers, uh, a team of people that want to uh, develop, uh, research uh, uh, the new cars, but as well develop themselves uh, as people, um, as a team, and, and develop the capabilities uh, around them. So I found myself doing the same exercise three times from a starting point that was pretty low in, in all the three cases, uh, building a, a group, a team up to um, all together, um, arriving to be successful. Was it always Formula One for you or could you have gone into the wider road car industry? I mean, you graduated from Bologna University, didn't you? mechanical engineer yes and then yes. was it always just focus on f1 oh no, yeah for, for me it was always uh, since i was uh, 15 years old looking at uh, nicky lauda james sant uh, battle was always uh, f1 mm, always f1 and uh, yeah i was uh, playing uh, yeah with uh, yeah, a lot of cars models and looking at them for many many years of my young life um did you ever want to be a racing driver I thought for a little while, but then I decided it was not for me. Yeah, it was not for me because, uh, no, I was more interested toward the, the car design, car development, and I I felt that it was, uh, mm, yeah, much better for me, if, even if uh, I, I, I like uh, still now uh, driving cars uh, on track. Um, but I don't think uh, I have the nowhere near the talent that is needed for, for that kind of job. 
You mentioned the mid 70s. I mean, that was such a wonderful era for design in Formula One, wasn't it? There was so much progress from one year to the next. It was a, are you a little bit jealous of the people who were designing cars in that era? Well, yeah, in, effectively, there was, um, yeah, uh, diversity uh, was, was uh, one of the things that you could see. Um, yeah, when uh, people introduced the um, turbo engine and you had in a year, uh, I can't remember if eight uh, different winners of a race. So it was, yeah, definitely cars were very different, but... Unfortunately, because uh, um, maybe the rule was uh, yeah allowing for more freedom, but also because uh, people and methodology they, they were not uh, uh, at such a high, high level. So people had uh, an idea, and uh, okay, um, we, with good uh, uh, engineering principle, they were designing a car, but uh, without knowing too much about aero, too, too much about handling. Now uh, nowadays, the, the modern technology they, they are bringing you somehow toward um, the same optimum sometime. So uh, they, they are pushing you toward the same solution. Um, so it would be much more difficult to have uh, such a variety of car, even if the rules uh, would have been more open. How interesting. Now, look, it's coming eight years at Mercedes. It's coming to an end. Can we talk about this team? Let's talk about this team now. Um, why has it been so successful, Mercedes? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, how much time have we got for the <laughs> answer? <laughs> yeah, in yeah, very essence, uh, I think um, as a group of people, we, um, we have been able to um, build a machine, a group uh, of, of uh, people and um, an organization that uh, is working uh, with a lot of strength, but as well a lot of values, uh, working very well together um, with uh, the same mindset, uh, looking very, very much uh, uh, further ahead, very consistent, uh, very um, detailed on every f everything we do, uh, wanting to reach the excellence in every activity we do. And yeah, the, the group uh, is, is at the end, uh, uh, such a well-oiled machine that is um, like uh, a thousand people working in parallel, pushing at the maximum they can and uh, working uh, very well together. So it's the group. The that group. Is, is that yeah. what you, is that the, this team's biggest strength? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so is the collaboration, collaboration with, between the people, uh, between the single people, but as well the single group, the groups, um, no politics at all, no uh, conflict. We are, we are pushing people to be, to challenge ideas, but in a, in a good way, in a good manner, in a positive uh, uh, direction. Of course, we are looking for the best talent in the world. So we, we are, we are, looking to build these very high talented people and put them together. Uh, in the company, we have uh, 30 different nationalities. So for us, uh, diversity is a strength of, of this company because you can take from every uh, person that is coming from a different university in the world, you can take something, you can take uh, different life experience, you can take a different uh, uh, university methodology, different tools, uh, different mindset, uh, and put together in a very harmonious uh, group. You've worked with many great people in your career. I just want to ask you about a few individuals here at Mercedes. First of all, what stands Toto Wolff apart from the other team principals you've worked with? Well, Toto, uh, yeah, he's... Um, He's a very, very special uh, uh, person, yeah. He, he came into the team, uh, I was telling him uh, that yesterday, mm, in a very humble way. He came in very, very softly, and then little by little he took uh, leadership, um, and now he's uh, our great uh, leader, and... Um, yeah, he's the master of uh, the behaviors in the company. Uh, so he's a role model for everybody of us uh, 
in, uh, in behaviors, uh, in uh, how we uh, deal with problems, uh, how we deal with, uh, with people. And, but in the, in the meantime, is not uh, in the clouds. Is, is uh, as it was uh, one of us. So we've got a good uh, relationship, uh, very uh, natural as friends. So he, he has got this double possibility that is not very normal uh, to be our leader without any doubt, but in the meantime to be uh, one of the mate. How different is his management style to that of Ross Braun, for example? Because it was Ross who brought you here in the first place, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah Ross, uh, he has been, of course, uh, uh, one of the best, if not, not the best, uh, technical director in the F1 history and uh, as well a great uh, team principal. Um, I've got a, got a lot of good uh, memories with Ross and uh, uh, we have worked uh, together in Ferrari for nine years uh, very, very well. And um, I came here immediately when he was calling me because of I trusted him. Um, so yeah, Ross, Ross gave uh, the big first contribution to this team to bring this team from, uh, um, unfortunately, a small team when, when Brown won the championship, but had to um, reduce the number of people in the company from a small team to the level of the team when, when he left. So he did uh, as well a great job. And, um, and then Toto was, uh, was going from that and, and uh, yeah, further developing the team, really arriving to where we are. Now, you say you worked with Ross for nine years at Ferrari. Another person you worked with at Ferrari, and again, here at Mercedes is James Allison. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about James. Yeah, James, uh, um, we worked together in Ferrari again very, very well. Uh, he was um, head of track hero in that moment and I was uh, head of the design office and the design activities and uh, yeah, collaboration was great since then. Since then. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we saw one each other at the technical working groups. Uh, we were part of the same club at the end for many years. And I, I was uh, one of the person that, uh, yeah, um, uh, liked a lot uh, from the news that uh, he was coming here. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic collaboration in the last few years with him. How do you feel both you and him have evolved over the last 15 years as engineers and as people? We, um, for sure, both uh, we have uh, learned how to manage uh, people, how to manage people, how to manage big group of uh, people and as well a much bigger scale project compared to uh, the one that we had to face when we were at Ferrari. Um, yeah, our knowledge, of course, uh, is much more wider. Um, I, I was a, a pure mechanical engineer and he was a, a pure aerodynamicist. And, and now our, our knowledge is uh, much wider in all the uh, car activities and uh, company activities. So, yeah, day and night, uh, I have to say. But, but, but same, you know, when, when things are... When you are working well with a person because of you've got the same mindset and uh, uh, there is full respect, respect one each other, th th that's something that uh, can carry on forever if there are not uh, events that are changes this, uh, this attitude. So th this was uh, the case with, uh, with James. He's a very talented person. He can learn things uh, uh, very quickly on also in areas where he, got, he has got less experience and uh, yeah, he's working uh, um, re really well, high potential for the future. So I think he's uh, the right man for this place. So that's the leading engineers. What about the drivers? Um, Lewis Hamilton, do you see many similarities between Lewis and Michael Schumacher? Yeah, I've been asked many times. Uh, yeah, Sorry. No, no, no problem at all. Uh, many times this question. Um, yeah, no, not, not super easy to answer because, uh, yeah, different age and different cars and uh, never, they never work together. Um, 
the, the similarities, the, the talent, of course, the both drivers, yeah, unbelievably talented. Um, by talent, what do you mean? Speed? Are we talking raw speed? Is that what you mean by talent? Yeah, speed, speed as well um, for the single lap, but as well um, average high, very high optimum speed uh, in the race extracting the maximum from a vehicle, uh, from tires, uh, from engine. Um, so using everything you give them to produce the best lap time in qualifying or the best uh, average lap time in, in the race. So the, these two guys, they never left anything behind, really. Uh, they used everything you gave him uh, to produce lap time. Um, Having said that, uh, slightly or quite different from the approach point of view, um, Michael wanted to do kilometers and kilometers and kilometers, and he, he was very, very methodic in that, uh, um, available to do uh, many laps in winter testing during the season. But Lewis uh, is um, yeah, he's doing that as well, but naturally he preferred the fight so he is uh, he wants to be you know fully dedicated on in a championship in a race uh, in in a fighting condition and and that is what he loves and that's where he, he give immediately the the best it's one of the reasons why michael tested so much because the simulation machines you had back then weren't as good as you have now yeah, there was uh, this effect, uh, this, this fact as well. You remember when Ferrari did uh, 90,000 kilometer in a year of testing? Um, yeah, we couldn't do it with one driver only, so we had, we had to use as well the racing drivers. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of, in the tire war, at the, in the days, a, a lot of tire testing and tires uh, to, to uh, let's say, to be sure that the tires were the tires that we needed for the race, uh, racing driver had, had to test that. In these days, you haven't got any more yeah, tire war, uh, tire are identical for the whole year. You cannot test uh, that much in season and uh, before the season, so it's completely different, the story. I mean, to do 90,000 kilometers of testing, did you have a team based permanently at Mugello or somewhere like that? Because you must have been out almost every day. No, there were there were three teams. <laughs> yeah, three teams. So you had one at Mugello? No, no the, the Ferrari had in that few years... Uh, what are we talking? We're talking mid-2000s, uh, mid are we? Uh, so yeah, 2003, yeah. four, that kind of yeah, time? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Could uh, simultane simultaneously test in three different circuits. So it was Fiorano, it was Mugello, and one other circuit around Europe. Every week there was a, a test in Fiorano. That's incredible, isn't it? Just yeah. the logistics of the it. The logistic. Is, yeah. is it? Three group of mechanics, uh, material, trucks, uh, everything. Yeah. I so mean, it was uh, yeah, very little research and development testing, so uh, very few facilities as well. And a lot of running and running and running. This was the the, the new avenue that Ferrari, um, let's say, invented and developed, and uh, that's why the great reliability of Ferrari in, the, in those years, uh, and uh, as well part of the big success of Ferrari. Um, then, when when everything uh, stopped, uh, team Ferrari had to go back and uh, quickly develop uh, capabilities in house. Mm. Oh, so it was a little bit behind on the simulation yeah. techniques because it had so much ability yeah. to, to yeah, test it on was, track. Uh, yeah, it was. More than, um, uh, let's say, uh, virtual simulation, uh, real test benching. Yeah. What did you all think of the Brazilian Grand Prix this weekend? It was good, wasn't it? There were some tense moments, that's for sure, and they were made all the more interesting thanks to Amazon Web Services. Let me tell you how. F1 uses machine learning and predictive modeling built on AWS to create critical race performance statistics, make race predictions, and give fans a deeper insight into the split-second decisions made by teams and drivers. And it's able to share these insights over television and digital platforms all over the world. 
Some of the most exciting racing action comes from driver battles, when a chasing driver gets close enough to attempt an overtake. The AWS battle forecast analyzes track history and projected driver pace to provide an insight into developing driver battles during the race, which might not be so obvious to the eye. Pit strategy battle provides real-time insight on the position of the two rival drivers, the predicted gap after their pit stops and percentage chance of an overtake while tyre performance gives an indication of tyre wear on a performance scale, highlighting the relative degradation between two cars in a battle. And it's all powered by AWS's incredible machine learning and data analytics. So next time you're watching F1 and wondering how they get all those awesome insights, just remember, AWS is how. Find out more at aws.com forward slash F1 insights. That's aws.com slash F1 insights. Right, let's get back to more stories from Aldo. Now, Aldo, you said that you always wanted to work in Formula One and being an Italian, did that mean that you Ferrari was the team for you? Was that the goal? A rite of passage almost for every engineer to want to work for Ferrari? No, to be honest, no. I, I was... Uh, um I was passionate about um, chassis design. It was very clear for me that I was not uh, that, that much uh, interested on the engine side. So it was more uh, chassis, suspension, handling, uh, the mechanical side of the car. And I was fascinated by the technical innovation. So I was looking to all cars being Ferrari or um, English cars. Uh, I was fascinated about uh, uh, who had the best uh, ideas and the best development. Uh, so I didn't have a particular... Um, I was fan of F1 chassis technical side, not, not uh, particularly fan of a single team. So was it a dream when you went to Ferrari, when you went there in 95? Was it a special moment? Yes, it was a special moment. Uh, my, my dream uh, started to become a reality when I joined Minardi in uh, 1988. Uh, there I was touching uh, with, with my finger the, my dream. And really, I came into Minardi thinking, OK, now with my effort, I will bring this team winning the championship. So I was <laughs> that level of <laughs> passion. And then... Uh, after seven years in Minardi, where I became chief designer and then technical director, um, I found myself that uh, we were um, struggling around uh, the, the not having the possibility to further grow up and uh, not having a bigger budget. And I was a bit struggling to, um, to follow my dreams. I had many, many idea, ideas in, in the mind, but I couldn't uh, apply them. And then when Ferrari came, that was the moment where, okay, now finally uh, I will have the possibility to apply all what uh, I think. And uh, it was uh, a huge, uh, uh, deep diving uh, exercise. So immediately try to apply what uh, I, I dreamt for years. So it was, it was the lure, the attraction of more resource to put your ideas into reality rather than Ferrari. If an English team had come to you, if yeah. McLaren had come to you, you might well have gone there. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think so. Yeah, even being Italian, of course, uh, I, I would have probably preferred to go to Ferrari. De de definitely being Italian at that moment. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as I said, I, I was not, uh, there was not this uh, single team target in my thinking. I, I wanted to, to grow together with the team I was working with. And you'd outgrown Minardi, I suppose. Yeah, Minardi was uh, for me a fundamental experience because the team was so small and I had the possibility to uh, go around uh, 360 degree on every kind of activity by priming it for the first time. So the first to go in the wind tunnel, first to go in um, doing the data acquisition, um, FE analysis, so uh, composite uh, development. So first, for me, it was first uh, activity on everything. 
And uh, I, I was learning quite a lot from this uh, priming of these activities. Just so we can compare, how many people were at Minardi in yeah. the early 90s? I, I came in the team as uh, number 32. So the team was 32 people <laughs> producing two cars, so the, the T car, so three cars for a weekend and participating to all the championship races. And when I left, it was 120. So you left and there was 120 and went to Ferrari, where there were how many? Uh, Ferrari, uh, at the time, uh, the um, design office in Maranello, the chassis design office was made of four people only. Because at that time, everything was done in England. With John, John Barnard. Barnard, FDD. Mm. So F Ferrari was doing in Italy only a few little things. Um, but there was the plan to bring back everything in Italy. And you arrived just as that plan yes, was... Yes, I was part being, of that plan. Part of the plan to bring it back home. Yeah. Um, before we move on from Minardi, I did just want to ask you about two things. One, um, the US Grand Prix, 1990. Pierluigi Martini qualifies second. Yeah. On the I mean, that must yeah. have felt... Yeah. Did that feel... You probably expanded a little bit more than 30-odd people, but that must have felt like a pole position. Yeah, yeah, no, it was amazing. It was amazing. But be before, before then, there was another moment, a key moment for Minard. It was uh, 1989, Silverstone race, last race, and then you went in pre-qualifying, and um, Pierluigi Martini came... Uh, fifth and Sala sixth. So we, we took three points in, in the temple of the speed in Silverstone where English team, they know how to do the cars for fast corners. And Minardi, yeah, we did it. And it was great. At that time, yeah, um, uh, together with uh, an English uh, aerodynamicist, Nigel Cooper Dwight, um, really, a really bright guy, um, yeah, we had the responsibility to develop uh, the car. And I had uh, one year and a half of experience. <laughs> Just thrown in at the deep end, get on with it. And you, you surely did. What engine did that 89? Yeah, it was a Cosworth uh, V8 uh, mother mm, done by this uh, uh, I mother uh, Swiss uh, um, preparator. Yeah. So that felt like a victory. Oh, yeah, like a victory. And then and the year after, yeah, first row in, uh, uh, in the USA. That yeah. was extraordinary. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah there, there was at that time as well a very good collaboration with Pirelli. Uh, so Minardi was a development team for, for Pirelli. And uh, again, together with Pierluigi Martini, uh, especially in qualifying trim, uh, the job was uh, really uh, done very well. Was he better than his results would have you believe, Martini? He's, he was, he was uh, very, very, very fast. Very fast. Especially in qualifying, he was uh, one of these guys that uh, yeah, could find the alpha second or the seven tenths in the right moment. So he was really, really fast. Well, and then the other race I wanted to ask you about with your Minardi hat on was um, 1991. Imola, yeah, fourth, yeah. Oh, yeah, another extraordinary giant killing performance by you guys. Yeah, it was uh, yeah another big big uh, uh, satisfaction. We, we had at that time the Ferrari engine, but we knew that uh, we had a two years old uh, Ferrari engine and uh, not the latest fuel. So we we had a uh, quite a, a decent gap in terms of performance. Uh, and um, yeah, the, we, we were developing the car during the season and yeah, the car was uh, responding quite well. And uh, it was the, the best year, I think, in the championship for, for Minardi. Seventh? Seventh. Yeah, yeah their best yeah. ever. Yeah, which for a small team with uh, as well um, in such conditions, it was, uh, it was great. So 1995, is it Jean Todd? who gets in touch with you first. Who was your point of contact at Ferrari initially? Yeah, my, um, I, I was working uh, in uh, Minardi for a uh, couple of years with Gustav Brunner. We, we took on board Gustav 
uh, I think in 1993, and three, uh, 1993 and four, he stayed with us, and then he went to Ferrari. And uh, yeah, again, very good um, relationship with Gustav and. Uh, um, yeah, working together as a team, and uh, when he was at Ferrari, we started talking uh, oh, together. So yeah, that's but how then, it, the initial contact. The initial was contact, made. but then was uh, was uh, yeah. Mm, and were you aware? Jean Todd, that was uh, yeah. Were you aware in '95 that there was the whole Schumacher juggernaut was about to arrive in '96 with Michael, and then obviously Ross and Rory Byrne and was, was that on the cards when you joined? No, no, at the beginning no, because uh, effectively I joined uh, the, um, that was another story, I joined uh, the GT um, car group uh, with the aim of develop a Ferrari F50 for Le Mans yeah, so with um, Claudio Lombardi Cla Claudio Lombardi that was uh, um, Aldo, I need to stop you there. Yeah. So you're a man who wanted to work in Formula One and yeah. you went to Ferrari to work on an F50. Yes. Yes, because, uh, um, yeah, again, was another um, personal reasons. Uh, I was um, living in Parma, working in Faenza, uh, following all the championship tests uh, and races. So again, for for family reason, I decided, okay, let, let's find uh, a job that I like, but uh, closer to home and with less traveling. And uh, I accepted this opportunity uh, that Claudio Lombardi offered me to develop a F50 uh, Le Mans, knowing that I was anyway, I would have been anyway in Ferrari. So sooner or later, they, they would have dragged me in the Formula Ooh. One activity. Oh, okay. So it was a sort of... Uh, an investment, let's okay. say. And uh, it happened, um, yeah, more quickly than I thought because it happened as, after three, four months. So I, I started in September and for the F50 GT um, and in January I was already in F1. In January 96? Yeah, 96. Because of, as I said, Gustav and then sure. Mr. Todd. What kind of Ferrari did you walk into? In January 96, because they hadn't won the driver's title since, what was it, 79 with Jody Schechter. Was there a sense of desperation? Did you feel that we've just got to, was there a lot of pressure on the team to start well, getting results? And I, I was, uh, yeah, walking in in Maranello design office uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the first feeling was, uh, unfortunately particularly bad because uh, that, that office as I said was very small using a different cut system from uh, the FDD of John Barnard having um, to move to another cut system that was uh, switched off under the tables uh, and, and dealing with, uh, with England only with a big uh, A2 plotter so it was yeah, situation. So it's a real transitional time. Real, yeah, transitional time starting from scratch, from, from everything. So that 96 Ferrari, please forgive me if I'm about to say the wrong thing, but I didn't think it was the best looking car I'd ever seen. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah <it's, laughs> but is that because there was this what period... What was it called? The, the armchair? I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so it looked like an armchair, didn't it? Yeah, but, it's a, um, but is that because there was all this transition going on as, as a, you were changing from one program to the next and maybe and moving everything back to Italy? Is that one of the reasons, do you think, that the car wasn't as effective? I mean, I, Michael Schumacher won a few yeah, races, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, but... but yeah, but I, for me it was difficult at the time to understand where, where, uh, yeah, where, where we were then because I started January '96. So the car was already designed, and uh, yeah, the, the assembly of the car happened after few few days, literally. Uh, so from that point onward, my, my task uh, um, was different. Was to start employing a lot of people and building a team, a design team, and uh, to start putting together design processes, uh, and the, the correct methodology, mentality, and um, 
participating to the development of 1996 car during the season. So I remember the Barcelona package, the Monza package, where Maranello started to be actively involved. And from then, uh, yeah, 1997, yeah, Maranello was a group was able to to put a bit more ideas on the car. And from 1998, the car was fully designed and developed in, uh, in Maranello. And who was the person you worked closest with there in Maranello? Was it Rory Byrne? Was it Ross? Just how, how, how was the structure? Yeah, the structure was, yeah, was very, very clear. I, immediately after um, I joined, arrived uh, Ross and then um, Rory. Um, but as well in parallel other fundamental people um, looking after other activity um, during the first year yeah it was a bit of a transition between FDD and uh, so dealing with uh, with John Barnard dealing with uh, Mike Coughlin in, in FDD and uh, with Ross and Rory in, in Maranello um, yeah with Ross and Rory without uh, sitting too much around the table the again the the relationship started immediately positive and then was great from day one really tell me a little bit about rory burn yeah south african lots of experience yeah. in f1 by the time you two got together my memories of him are of someone with huge energy yeah huge energy yeah. and he i remember him telling me that he used to keep a notepad by his bed and yeah, that he'd yeah. wake up in the middle of the night yeah, yeah. with an idea and quickly yeah. write it down yeah, i mean yeah. quite an inspirational figure for you yeah yeah he did he did yeah yeah it was it was uh, very inspirational for me um and yeah somehow we found ourselves a very uh, complementary in terms of uh, again how we behave and our mindset and it was working perfectly well because he was more uh, the guy that did uh, the link between aero performance track and the design office. And I was uh, I was the guy that was uh, uh, developing with uh, uh, very detailed methodology the the design activity. And uh, yeah, how frustrating did it get so you say by 98 everything's being designed and built in Maranello yeah. yet at the last race at 97 it was the last race it went the other way to Jacques Villeneuve 98 yeah. it went yeah. the other way to yeah. Mika how can you just can you remember what what the atmosphere was like back then and what you were all thinking yeah oh, it and then was, of course uh, there was 99 as well when Michael yeah, broke his leg as well. yeah 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 it was uh Unbelievable! It was almost there, almost there, and then not yet, not yet, not yet. But th this gave us uh, the boost to do better and better and better. And yeah, we we did at that time a lot of little mistakes. The the organization had to learn and avoid for for the future. And literally, when the organization became much more mature in 2000, 2001, yeah, it was a much more complete organization, um, a sort of very fine mesh net that was not allowing for any other mistake but at the very beginning yes we we, we did and it was was natural we were uh, growing from uh, from nothing really because uh, can you imagine to bring from england to maranello everything not only the design but as well the the production of all the components uh, um, the yeah the pre-assembly and uh, uh, develop the whole team it was a monumental uh, activity. Now, for a man who's won 26 world titles, <laughs> but did you derive much pleasure from the Constructors' Championship in 99? Because it was your first. So you had the Constructors' title on the one hand, but equally you lost the driver's title yeah. at the last race in Japan. Can you remember how that felt? Oh, yeah, I remember very, very well, but... Not making, uh, I'm not making differences between constructor and uh, drivers. So I know that, uh, yeah, in uh, for Mr. Montezemolo was the driver more important. Uh, in here, in um, in our team in Mercedes is uh, yeah the constructor because of 
Mercedes thinking and the, um, big OEM constructor is, is the constructor that is the biggest. To be honest, uh, I, I wanted uh, both um, as much as possible all the time. So it still felt great. Yeah. So then the the, the proper job delivered hundred percent for me was uh, both uh, championships. Which started in 2000. Can you now describe what it was like just to ride that wave of success with Ferrari and how you kept the motivation up and what was it like? Yeah, the winning, winning from starting from scratch or starting from a not winning situation and arriving to win is a, is a big, big peak of uh, satisfaction, motivation. But I found always much more difficult to keep uh, the, the, the winning process ongoing because uh, mm, yeah, it's natural that the organization get uh, satisfied by the result uh, or, or people uh, uh, slightly less motivated or people leaving uh, because of uh, you are winning and they, they can go in nice position in other teams. Uh, so it's, it's becoming more and more and more difficult every, every year to maintain the, the winning path is becoming more and more difficult. And again, you need to work uh, like we did here in Mercedes. You need to work together like we do in, uh, in Mercedes in, um, in January. We go outside two days with, with Toto and all the other directors and we discuss about uh, the, the next target and we discuss about how to reach it. And one of the big discussion was uh, how can we carry on winning? What do we need to do? And yeah, again, a lot of activities. Because they're quite similar from the outside, at least. The, the dominance you had with Ferrari and the dominance you've had with Mercedes in terms of numbers aren't massively different in terms no, of yeah, the success. Similar, yeah. So how uh, success is similar, yeah. but how different are the two experiences? Success is similar, but as well, uh, the two experiences are, are not that, uh, that far because, uh, again, in Ferrari, in the winning, uh, during the winning time, there was a group of people, um, Todd and uh, uh, Ross, uh, um, creating a sort of shell around Ferrari that was managing and coping with the pressure that all the Italian environment or, uh, let's say, high-level uh, bosses uh, inevitably wanted to create. Because, uh, yes, it's, it's true, there is more pressure, or there, there was, I don't know now, there was more pressure in Ferrari than at Mercedes, for example. And is the media responsible for some of that? The Italian media, does that, do you feel that as a Ferrari employee? Yeah, you feel it. Uh, I felt it because um, it, uh, the Ferrari must win, must win all races, must win all championship, uh, is always in the center of... Uh, the, the millions of uh, passionate people looking at you and wanting uh, you to win. So you feel you feel this pressure. And um, yeah, there was a group of people protecting the, the engineers uh, to feel the correct pressure. And, and there was harmony between people. There was a, somehow it was created a, an atmosphere very, very similar to what, uh, what is the atmosphere uh, year, for example, for a few years, so it was uh, it was good. So there are quite a lot of uh, similar activities and quite a lot of similar result for for that. In Mercedes, the the pressure is uh, we don't need this big uh, shell around around the team because uh, uh, there is less pressure. There is less pressure from the board. Uh, there is uh, less pressure from Daimler, and the pressure here is. Um, a sort of a nice sporting pressure that everybody of us are applying in the job. Mm, but you don't feel the nasty fr pressure from outside. How interesting. How interesting. And do you think being located in England helps? I, I think so. Yeah, I think it helps. Yeah, I think it helps. Uh, yeah, in uh, 
in general, uh, this helps to keep the, the group uh, calm and um, yeah, to work uh, in a very consistent manner. Um, so there are very, very little oscillations, let's say, up and down, very consistent uh, mode. And at the end, uh, if you ask the engineers uh, to develop uh, new ideas, uh, to aim high, to aim long, uh, and uh, you need to allow them to uh, to fail and you need to be happy that a uh, few times they fail and you need to trust them for the following uh, challenge. If you apply pressure and you want to keep uh, the pressure high because you want to win next race, next race, engineers normally they tend to, to not be so creative and to deliver something that is uh, safer, something that is uh, more shorter term. And then this will influence your development pace. So that's why you need to protect them, you need to leave them thinking, you, you leave them trying hard and uh, aim high, and then you manage the risks. Now, of the five years that you did the double, as in constructors and drivers at Ferrari, 2003 to 2004 inclusive, which was the most satisfying season for you? No. <clears throat> The, the double, yeah, probably the, the first one was uh, an unbelievable emotion because, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, I can't remember, 20 odd years that Ferrari didn't do that. And probably the 2004. 2004, it was, uh, yeah, again, uh, an impressive car and impressive result. Probably th these are the two greatest memories. And we've talked about Michael, but there was obviously, uh, he had the same teammate throughout that period, Rubens Barrichello. Um, yeah. How much credit should Rubens take for his part in those championships? Oh, yeah, Ru Rubens, he tried, he tried hard. Um, yeah, unfortunately, he had Michael as, as a teammate, which is not that easy to be uh, as, a, as a problem. Um but so, his technical yeah. ability. People tell yeah. me he was very, very no, good he, he at was, developing uh, a car. Yeah, he, he was. Um, I, I remember that uh, his car, um, time to time, had a very um, nice, nice features from from the setup point of view and uh, uh, from the handling point of view. And uh, he was, uh, yeah, contributing uh, to the success of Ferrari uh, by by trying to, yeah, to develop things on the setup that. Uh, uh, were more interesting compared to, to Michael. And time to time, uh, yeah, they have been used. We'll be back with the final part of this week's episode in just a minute. But first, I'm going to let you in on a little tip that can help you create fuss-free dinners from scratch. HelloFresh are the UK's leading recipe box service. They deliver fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step -step recipes to your door so you can turn those delicious ingredients into delicious dinners with ease. I was lucky enough to get Centre Box, which came with a mix of different recipes, so we were spoilt for choice. We had honey mustard sausages with sweet potato mash and sticky red onion gravy. Yum. There was also beef fried rice and a chicken dish. It was so simple to use. I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. You can choose from 19 recipes every week, including rapid recipes, which you can whip up in 20 minutes or less, family favorites, British and world cuisine, and even lower calorie balanced meals. Subscriptions are flexible with no fixed minimum term. So if for any reason you need to change your usual delivery, skip weeks, or alter your box size to suit you or your family's needs, you can and they deliver six days a week. HelloFresh are offering our listeners £60 off four boxes. All you have to do is visit www.hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code GRID at the checkout. So visit hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code GRID at the checkout so you too can enjoy dinner without the drama. Right, let's dive back into our chat with Aldo. What brought you to Mercedes then? Let's fast forward to 20. 11 i mean yeah. so you win that title in 2004 five and six and then kimmy obviously wins in 2007 but yeah. and what made you give up you know a team like ferrari you had the resource that you wanted as an engineer yeah. to take carry ideas through what was it about mercedes that you thought yep so for me um 
Yeah, when I came here in December uh, 2011, as you know, I my, my last uh, few weeks in Ferrari, they, they were not very pleasant. Mm, yeah, um, we had uh, Mr. Montezemolo that wanted to do a change, but the change was managed quite uh, violently. And um, yeah, for me it was... Uh, unacceptable to drop down as a technical director and do something else in Ferrari. And then I immediately, in the same day, I, I left because I, I never accepted um, waiting in Ferrari as many other people have done, uh, waiting for the next job. So I came out from Ferrari, yeah, very, very upset, of course, and uh, yeah, with, with a wish to have a revenge and a, re, a wish to uh, to build another strong experience. Hello, can I just, do you feel that you were the full guy for Alonso? Alonso failing to, to, to win the championship Ferrari, do you feel that Montezemolo felt he needed to blame somebody and you were, uh, were the person who ended up? Yeah, to, to be honest, I don't know what uh, what happened because no one explained to me. So it was, it was so sudden. Uh, after uh, you arrive in December, yeah, we we lost the championship, the previous championship at the last race, but we won 2010 uh, five races with Fernando, so very close to win the championship. Contract renewed, uh, a lot of uh, pat pat on the shoulders. Uh, yeah, good job. In in few months after. Uh, yeah, especially after a bad Barcelona race, you you receive this news that, uh, okay, you are not anymore technical director, you will do something else in the company. Um, yeah, it's, uh, n no one ever explained to me what happened. It was a quick communication from Stefano Domenicali, um, never spoken with uh, Montezemolo, never spoken with um, Alonso, or anyone else of the company. Did Stefano try and explain to you? No, it, was, it was a quick uh, communication. I'm a friend of Stefano's uh, still now, but uh, in that moment it was uh, just a quick communication with no big reasons, just uh, because of, you know, Barcelona race was bad and the, the championship started uh, badly. How frustrating to have ended what had been such a fantastic period of your life until until then yeah it was uh, the, the frustration was immense mm. after 16 years uh, um, of success and uh, for me it was very very uh, a difficult time for a couple of months it's like uh, uh, being on a high speed train and all of a sudden you find yourself uh, in the station steady and your brain is uh, is carrying on to go at the speed of the train so you you have for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, still uh, you know you are thinking at the project that uh, uh, were being developed for the mid-season development or you, you think why what it happened why it happened and what happened and yeah you haven't got any answer did so, it affect your love of formula one did you think yeah, at any I mean, moment, I don't yeah. want to work in this business anymore? Yeah, 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 I thought. I thought, and I have to say, the extreme help was coming from my wife. I remember when she said to me that my story in Formula One, it was not possible to be finished like that. And, and then she was pushing me to find another solution, don't worry about the family, uh, you need to have your revenge. So for me, it was a fundamental, that uh, support. And um, and a lot of friends. I kept all the messages. And yeah, be beautiful messages from everybody. And uh, yeah, it was a very, very emotional time. But uh, this response of uh, all the people that... Uh, uh, like you and and uh, gave me the you know the strength to go ahead and to find another challenge and i guess your wife formula one is all she's known is that right yeah for formula, <laughs> formula one, yeah she she's not a fan of formula one and she's uh, not a fan no she's not a fan <laughs> and uh, she is supporting me yeah for the last 31 years and uh, 
so is uh, even uh, greater what uh, she does because uh, she's not a fan of motor racing. So Ross, did, did Ross pick up the phone to you or you yeah, to him? No, and the, just... the first one was uh, Adam Parr from Williams. Williams. Uh, Williams yeah, it was right. uh, the same day, the same day that the press was saying, okay, Aldo Costa dropped down as a technical director. He was immediately on the phone saying, okay, would you like to come here to uh, to work in our team? And I went uh, yeah, two, three days after in Williams for for an interview. And then... Uh, I was just going to say, Toto was involved with Williams back then, wasn't he? No, not yet. Not I don't yet. think, no, 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 not yet, <laughs> not yet. And How then, did the interview go? What did you think of Williams? Yeah, at that time, uh, yeah, it was um, it was uh, a very positive interview, and um, I was quite uh, quite keen. Yeah, strangely enough, uh, I, I I was uh, I had to work together with Mike Coughlin uh, again. That was when yeah. he was back at Williams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very small world. This yeah, very small world. world. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, for me it was uh, it was fine. And um, but then, yeah, talking with Ross. Uh, yeah, I remember I went in uh, Fort de Marmi for uh, for a dinner, and uh, yeah, there we started to dream uh, a possible collaboration. And he was explaining the project, and for me it was uh, literally uh, working with him, working with Michael, working with uh, such a big group like uh, Daimler with such good wish of uh, progressing, investing and building a strong team uh, for, for me was uh, really... Mm, it's what we call a no-brainer. No-brainer. Was yeah. it, is that how it was yeah, for Absolutely. You? Yeah. Yeah. No-brainer. So I stopped uh, all the other contact I had and uh, yeah, I, I went there. Were you nervous about coming to live in England? No, again, strangely enough, in my life I never consider the the idea to living abroad is is strange eh? yeah he spent uh, so much time abroad but only to go to ra racing yeah racing not? because i never moved my family from parma in all my life so um, i'm the king of commuting probably <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah i never thought to to come here yeah I remember I interview an interview uh, with Pat Simmons. <laughs> I can quote that. <laughs> he told uh, when he was at Reno, and uh, he said to me, uh, "Aldo, you yeah, you are working in Ferrari, but uh, you cannot say you have really, really worked in F1 if you are not coming at least once in England to work for an English team." Yeah. So I did it. You've ticked that box. <laughs> yeah, I've ticked that box. But and how you, you live? You've been living in Oxford. I understand. Yeah, in how, Oxford. How does I forget, I've never been to Parma. Yeah. Um, I eat a lot of the ham. But, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how does Oxford compare to Parma? Do you do you feel at home? Yeah, absolutely. I I feel at home. Um, and then I was looking to found to find an environment where my family could um, happily come to England and um, and yeah, find themselves at home. And I think I was um, a bit um, under predicting the result because uh, once uh, selected a uh, nice house in Oxford and uh, in the center and I had since then the, the house full of people for... <laughs> All your friends coming to stay yeah, for, yeah. for seven years, <laughs> full of people. So my, my wife, she was coming at 10 days a month. And then my, my daughter, she was here at Mercedes uh, um, working with HR for a few months and uh, with the boyfriend and my son, with the girlfriend, friends and yeah, full of. It's been a full on family yeah, experience. Family, friends, it? yeah. So you get the band back together. Yeah. You, Ross, Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. How different was Michael second time around compared to his Ferrari days? My, it was um, in term Michael as a person. He was the same Michael. Yeah, the same Michael with the same motivation. Um, so it was very. I was very pleased to work with him again. Um, yeah, he was. He was uh, with Nico. He was a. Uh, struggling, uh, uh, he was struggling uh, a bit more about the, the, the performance in general. 
which is a, a you know a normal thing a natural thing and um, yeah this is what uh, did he you did think he struggle? Uh, you need to accept it was the first time in his life that he'd struggled against a teammate do you think he did he find that particularly hard i think yeah he was trying to to find uh, ways where where we, he could uh, he could uh, catch up and uh, um, starting back to lead in terms of performance so it was um, yeah in that uh, in that moment of his career where he was uh, needing uh, um, to to understand where effectively effectively he was and then when you know how you were saying it took until 1998 for ferrari to really have its everything under control in Maranello and producing everything from Maranello. How long did it take, given that this team, Mercedes, was born in 2009 and didn't have any resource back then, how long did it take Mercedes, do you think, to really hit its stride and become the force that it is today? For me, is um, yeah, unfortunately, the, um, when the, the Brown team... Uh, hmm, lost uh, a lot of people it was not only the people uh, the reduced number of people but was as well a big stop in terms of uh, capability development uh, a big stop in terms of uh, money availability to do things from the maintenance from the day by day development that was uh, limiting the development of the team and the first uh, um, year and a half two years it was that little team that was operating and, and uh, couldn't uh, reach good result. And, and this was uh, the acknowledge that uh, that kind of model was not a winning model. So at that time, uh, Daimler with Ross, they decided that, okay, this is not the model that we need to, to follow. We need to boost people capability, investment in general, and, and yeah, then the climbing started. When, so what, are we talking 2012? 20, yeah, end of 20, during uh, recognizing it in 2010 and 2011, and starting with the new, aiming for, the, for a new model in 20, second part of 2011, 2011, yeah. So your first full year was 12? 12. At what point were you guys focusing on 2014, the new regulations? Or was that your main focus from the moment you no, joined? No, 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 no. There was, um, there was a focus on 2012, uh, of course, uh, small details and uh, local performance aspect. And, and then there was a full focus on 2013 car, which was the last, uh, the last V8. But the big effort was doing uh, almost uh, three cars uh, in, in parallel. So there was uh, still the 2012 uh, development and the 2013 uh, already yeah, half developed and uh, yeah, starting the 2014 car. And th this was the key, uh, starting very, very early, powertrain very early, and, and us as well very, very early with, with as well uh, starting um, with good uh, new capabilities uh, for, for the hybrid engine, for the hybrid uh, car in general, to then arriving to 2014 already on track with, with a product that was already running and uh, reliable enough. Aldo, how funny that when you join Mercedes... You're working on three cars. And as you leave Mercedes, you're working on three yeah, cars again. There's right? <laughs> <It's> a parallel <laughs> there. Yeah, there is a parallel there. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's funny. Yeah. Now, I asked you which of your favorite years were when you were dominating with Ferrari. I want to ask you the same question now yeah. with Mercedes. of Since 2014, which yeah. has been the most enjoyable, the most rewarding season? Um, yeah, pro probably the... Um, there are two for two different reasons. One is the 2013 car and season, the last uh, um, V8. The last V8, uh, we, did a, we did a big uh, step from fifth, I think, in the championship. We became second and we were much closer to 
uh, Red Bull and uh, yeah um, we we yeah in the constructor we were better than Ferrari so that that car was the first big uh, satisfaction also because uh, yeah people here are very proud if you put side to side the 2012 and the 2013 the 2013 the whole group did uh, as i mentioned before a big jump mm, with quite a lot of risks to manage but a big jump on on any kind of technology in every area of the in car every from area aero of the car. to packaging yeah, to yeah 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 Okay, so that's one. It was the year where we had, for example, just to give one example, the, the gearbox with the internal aluminum cassette surrounded by a, a carbon structure. In these days, uh, most of the gearboxes are like that. Uh, in that particular car, it was the first time uh, Formula One saw such a layout. That was a big risk. From yeah, a reliability that was a big risk. Yeah, uh, it was a big risk. Or oh, suspension design starting having a you know lower wishbone very 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 high where does an idea like that come from aldo whose idea is it to go and i tell you what let's you, do you the gearbox the, the like gearbox this. yeah uh, but uh, is it one person who comes up with it yeah, or is it a conversation or? no it can, can be both it can be anything um we yeah we spoke many many times how how to uh, improve innovation what are the methodology to uh, take out these ideas from the group uh, and can be anything. Uh, we, we have got working groups uh, that are focused on a, on a certain area of the car and the, in these working groups uh, they, they are free to, to propose anything they want and to go even ahead. So they, they, they are fully respons responsible for delivering better better product. So they feel engaged people, they feel uh, capable to contribute. Yeah, in this particular case, it came uh, yeah from the chief designer John <laughs> John Owen. <laughs> that is, I remember for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, norm so normally the idea is a, a starting point, the idea, and and then the whole group jump on it and and uh, articulate the idea in a deeper and deeper way. Fascinating. So that's one. Very Example. successful year. Yeah, and but it was a successful year, but uh, yeah, we, we uh, the um, to win in F1, uh, you need to have a complete puzzle, is what I uh, used to remember people. So if uh, two, three elements of the puzzle are not there, you, you cannot win. So you need to have everything that is top level. And in that particular case, uh, we, it was not the case. So we were still not mature enough as uh, knowledge of the group to, to deliver a successful championship. On the opposite, it happened straight away in 2014. And yeah, that, that was the year where the rewarding was uh, maximum. For me, going for the team in, on the podium uh, in Bahrain, Mm, yeah, it was the key moment of 2014. And of the six years of success that have followed, yeah, which has been the most satisfying? I think, uh, as I mentioned before, it was um, the difficulties were growing uh, each year because uh, the powertrain formula stayed the same, so the other manufacturer could uh, catch up so the the advantage we had was uh, smaller and smaller on that so we had to push much harder on other aspects of the car um, so it was a sort of a continuous uh, process uh, that brought us uh, where, where we are in this moment and if you look at 2014 why we won and 2018 why we won um yeah, there are different aspects that are, uh, let's say, a key element of the victory. So when you look back, I mean, Aldo, over your 31 seasons in Formula One, when were you happiest? I, I think a uh, year at Mercedes in these last few years. Uh, yeah, for me it was... Um, a sort of, um, yeah, Minardi was a brilliant experience, young and very motivated, um, learning everything. And then Ferrari was, uh, 
yeah, solid uh, delivery of a lot of things and, uh, yeah, huge satisfaction for the championship. But here is uh, learning for from my all my mistakes that I have done in Minardi, I've done in Ferrari as an engineer, but as well as a person, as a manager. Um, for me, I, I was able, again, together with, uh, with a nice group of people to deliver the best uh, performance of all the group and, and myself as well. I've known you for a few years and you've, you have looked very happy here. Yeah. You know, like you're having a good time and I guess the success helps, doesn't it? But Yeah. But it is as well a change of mentality. Yeah. People that mo know me, um, uh, we have many Italians engineer here and some of them, they, they, they were coming from Ferrari uh, and they say that I'm more smiling here than at Ferrari, that I look more relaxed, I look more, um, yeah, less stressed. Are they and right? They are, they are right. They are right and is uh, because of, as, as I said to you, the pressure, the, the difference of pressure, but as well, having learned that uh, it's much, much better to drive the people uh, with a smile, to create a, a very harmonious group, uh, um, people that are coming in the morning and they are smiling to you because they are happy to work together. Um, so it's, it's, uh, I strongly believe in this moment, in this model. I, I, I hate the model of... Uh, angry people or shouting people or um, tense people I'm convinced 100% that they don't deliver the best and, and as a group they don't deliver what they can Which has been the most rewarding set of regulations to work on? Uh, for me the, the current one um, because as a fan of Formula 1 I, I, I like to be in an era where the car are the fastest uh, of all time. I am an engineer. I am a fan of F1, of uh, fast car. I like these uh, white cars with uh, a lot of performance, uh, fastest as ever. So I don't, I don't like particularly when uh, you do things when the cars goes back uh, five seconds or something like that. So when they made them faster a few years back, that was yeah, that, that was, got the thumbs that, up from yeah, Mr. Yeah, Costa, absolutely, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I was very fascinated. Yeah. As a designer, Def do yeah. you get a lot of ideas from other racing cars or is it other aspects of life? Do you look at aeroplanes and say, ah, why, why don't we try that? Yeah, as a designer, um, yeah, monitoring uh, the, the other cars is one of the constant aspects. Uh, and you need to be humble to, to look at the, at the grid front to rear. Uh, I remember yeah, for many years, uh, um, myself I was walking uh, front to rear. And, and you, you, you can see as well Adrian Newey going uh, front to rear. Uh, watching to all the cars and uh, joking with the Red Bull people when they wanted to stop you looking at their car. So it, it was a sort of... All uh, the mechanics around the back of yeah, the car, don't yeah, look exactly, at the diffuser. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was a sort of a nice... Um, um, Although you mentioned a name, actually. I was going to ask you about Adri yeah. Adrian. Yeah. Um, your respect for him, in, uh, for the work he does, and, and, as a, and as a rival as well. Yeah, he, he, has, uh, he has done a... A very, very uh, huge, bright, big career in in F1, and uh, I was definitely the first one to um, to see his cars when he was uh, at Leyton House, <laughs> and he was at Minardi. So for me, was already one of the people to target or to learn from. Um, and then, yeah, he has carried on with. Uh, uh, again, pushing a lot on all the structures that he has done along all those years, uh, all the um, aerodynamic developments and all the new technology that he has brought uh, together with these groups in F1. Did you ever so get a, lo a lot of uh, respect? Of, um, Did you ever get close to working with Adrian at any point? No, no, not uh, not really. No. It's interesting though that 
uh, like you, Adrian loves driving cars. Yeah, I know, he's got I know. his Lotus 49 yeah, and yeah, he's got his Leighton it's... House. Yeah, and he's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your passion for driving cause, and what have you driven? Yeah, so my, my, my passion, you go in your life cycle toward the... Uh, yeah, university and then work, 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 uh, family, young kids, uh, so you don't do anything. And then when you arrive at 40 years old, you start um, running, cycling, swimming. It's a well-trodden <laughs> path. Or, 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 <laughs> yes. or uh, something else. And I started as well something else. I did my first uh, Formula Ford uh, training course with young uh, go-kart uh, drivers. In, uh, age 40? Age 40. Did your wife say that you had a midlife crisis? Yeah, pro she probably did, yeah. she thought about <laughs> And it was, uh, yeah, at Ferrari when they invented a very nice thing. Um, any manager could select um, one, two things to do to improve as a manager, as a person. And uh, yeah, a lot of people, they wanted to go in USA to do some management course and so on. And I wanted to do a um, Formula 4 driving course. <laughs> <laughs> I love they, that. I yeah. absolutely love that. <laughs> they were looking at me a bit strange, but uh, that, that's what I did. And were you quick? Uh, yeah, it's, I was, yeah, I was, I was happy. I was happy, but of course there, there were, um, yeah, go-kart uh, drivers, uh, 15, 16 years old as well. Uh, the first car training course, but yeah, they were faster than me. But I was, uh, yeah, defending myself quite well. Yeah, I was happy. <laughs> Good. And, and, and what about the F1 cars you've driven? Because you've driven some Mercedes, haven't you? Yeah, the... Uh, I've driven a Mercedes, but um, before that, uh, there was a long preparation because, um, yeah, the story is that 1990, uh, the uh, Minardi, the, the chief designer, was me, 29 years old, and the two drivers, uh, Pierluigi Martini, 29 years old, and uh, Paolo Barilla, 29 years old. <laughs> So we, we became, as you can imagine, uh, very friend, very friend. And uh, um, Paolo is uh, from Parma. So I, I kept uh, seeing uh, Paolo in all my life. Uh, yeah, strangely enough, myself, Paolo and Gianpaolo Dallara. Whenever in Parma, they were looking for F1 speeches. They were inviting uh, our three. So we, we were in contact quite a lot. At a certain point, uh, Paolo told me that, um, mm, I think uh, you've done, yeah, Formula Ford uh, training course and uh, I did the Ferrari road car training course as well, but to proper appreciate what you are doing in terms of uh, work, you need to test a Formula One car. So, yeah, he, um, I went with him on track and uh, um, I, I was testing um, a radical, trying a radical, and then uh, um, after a radical, a Formula 3 old Chevron, and as well, uh, uh, and then after that, uh, I, I jumped into a 1981 FW7 Alan Jones Williams. A race winner, no less. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, in Mugello, not a small circuit. <laughs> <laughs> and then in Imola, um, a Ferrari 312B, from Clay Ragazzoni in 1970. Um, again, two cars that um, Paolo took and uh, completely rebuilt it and uh, uh, prepared in, in, a, in a beautiful way with, with a group of uh, Parma uh, mechanics. And um, yeah, so I, I tested, um, tried the, those cars. Uh, so for me, it was, was a good preparation and then Coming here, Toto knew that I was uh, somehow um, yeah, very happy to, to test car and to try cars. And we did the Mille Miglia together, myself and Toto, on a um, Mercedes Panamericana. Yeah. And after that, uh, Minardi uh, spoke with Toto asking uh, for a car in, in Imola during the Minardi day. In the last six, seven years, uh, Minardi is doing uh, 
the Minardi Day. That's a really nice thing. Have you gone back to that day every year, the Minardi Day? Yeah, it was during the Minardi Day that I was running the 312B. Oh, yeah. oh okay. So, but we, with a, with a, um, okay, it was not an official uh, <laughs> documented thing. No, so, I love the fact because that. Because also, was, I was a Mercedes, but I was running a Ferrari. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a white, a bit a yeah. white helmet <laughs> and, and uh, off we go. Yeah. Yeah. But what, so, and then that's when you got to drive. The Mercedes. Yeah, exactly. Which, which Mercedes was it? Yeah, it was the um, the 2013 car. So the last V8, the car that won uh, yeah many races, and uh, the car that I was very proud of. Yeah, was uh, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon, and was a yeah, fantastic experience. Uh, I had a smile in my face. Uh, my wife was saying for at least two weeks, <laughs> constant. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think driving makes you a better engineer? Yeah, I think, uh, yes, Paolo Barilla was right. Not because um, I could feel the understeer, oversteer, because I, I'm nowhere near close to the limit as the proper racing driver. But things like uh, yeah, how a driver is... Um, well or not installed in the in the cockpit which are the things that uh, he like he, he ate of, of, of a car installation um, so that, that for sure yeah which preparation you need to do uh, how, how detailed you need to to be when a driver is saying that is uh, okay there is something that he doesn't like what, what, what does it mean um, so all of that was pretty clear for me clearer for me and in terms of driving uh, uh, yeah you just appreciate uh, how, how these uh, these guys uh, are how, how talented they are because you are so far from them that you have the feeling that they are not coming from this world so had Lewis been there at Imola how much faster do you think he would have been oh yeah quite, quite a bit <laughs> Yeah, I think... Don't be modest. No, no, I think um, here are people with uh, John, the, the chief designer, John Owen. He said, uh, Maldo, you, you have to go not uh, more than 20 seconds slower. <laughs> 20 <laughs> not, not more than 20 <laughs> seconds slower. And I did it. Oh. I did it. So I put probably between 15 and something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Aldo, it's been such a wonderful career to have observed from the outside and seed all your success all those many wins and world championships but you're moving to Dallara going back home can live see more of your family I get all that how are you taking your foot off the throttle a little bit are you going to be as busy with Dallara what's the role no, as, um, as Toto, uh, Toto was saying in uh, yeah in one of the last press releases, is is saying that uh, Aldo's uh, burning fire for motor racing is not uh, ended, and yeah, Toto is right. It's like uh, my my passion, my fire for motor racing is not uh, is not ended, but for me, is uh, going to the Lara is like uh, a sort of closing the circle of my experience. He was the, I didn't say that to you, but he was the first guy to who I asked a job once uh, graduated. And he was the guy that was telling me, uh, I haven't got any possibility, but uh, Abarth, Claudio Lombardi, yeah, he's looking for an engineer. Go there and try uh, to have an interview. And then I went there employed and for six months I was working on rally cars on the Lancia Delta Integrale uh, as a stress engineer and then Minardi called me and I jumped to to the Minardi team so yeah he was the first one I've been in contact with him for 30 years uh, full of respect for his career is his company and uh, and for me going back to that is like uh, as i said um, closing the full circle what's of my the, life what's the job going to be are you going to 
look over for everything or are you going to have a specific championship you're going to look after oh, i will be the cto of the of the group so i will uh, i will be in charge of all the the technical activity um, so the spectrum is quite wide because uh, it is going from the um, single seat uh, formulas that the, the, the lara is producing so there are quite a few of them to racing activities uh, like uh, um, Le Mans uh, or even F1 or development of uh, high performance vehicle like the um, Stradale, the Dallara Stradale or consultancy for OEMs. Uh, so very, very wide spectrum of activities, which is the thing that really I like. So I don't want to be focused only on one, but I want to push ahead um, all of them and again doing a, a sort of fourth cycle of my life contributing helping from the current situation to move the group toward uh, an higher level in terms of organization technical organization uh, methodology design processes capabilities um, so that, that's what uh, I aim to do for the uh, next part of my life well, Aldo, it's been a it's been a wonderful career. Mercedes is going to miss you. Formula One is going to miss you. And all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for your time. It's been wonderful to chat. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I I will miss uh, Mercedes and all the friends and uh, all the people here. Um, so I will keep uh, all my memory and time to time. I'm sure that I will come back uh, to have some uh, social activity together with my friends. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you. Thank you. What an incredible guy. So modest and yet clearly so knowledgeable and capable. I loved his reflections on life at Minardi and some of their giant killing performances. And it was also fascinating to hear about life at Ferrari and the pressures that exist there. Like Mercedes technical director James Allison, who appeared on this podcast earlier in the year, Aldo places a lot of emphasis on the work ethos at Mercedes and on the word team. He just gave great insight from start to finish. Thanks for your time, Aldo. It was great to catch up and good luck at Dallara. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode, but we'll be back next week with another big name from the world of F1. Until then, why not subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thanks for your feedback about last week's episode with Mika Hakkinen. Like me, many of you were enthralled by what the Flying Finn had to say. He just had so many great stories, didn't he? Mick Ilbat got in touch via Twitter to say this. Kick his ass. I don't think I've heard anyone say that. Pross maybe, but not like Mika Hakkinen. What a gem of a F1 Beyond the Grid podcast. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mikkel. Lovely to hear your thoughts. And there were just so many great turns of phrase from Mika, weren't there? It was just lovely to hear him in such great form. And please keep your feedback coming. We love it. Remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>